Ashley, did you know that more than 77% of young people who are abusing drugs in Hong Kong are doing it alone and not seeking any help? Did you know that? Did you know that more than 58% of young people who are abusing drugs in Hong Kong didn't even know they were drug addicts? Did you know that? And did you know that the youngest recorded drug abuser in Hong Kong was only 10 years old? This is how serious the drug issue is in Hong Kong, which I'm going to talk a little about later. But before I talk about drug issues and the other issues facing our youth, who is our Hong Kong youth? Can anybody tell me? Oh, that's the title. Who's our Hong Kong youth? Can anybody describe that? Any adjectives, descriptions? Don't be shy. They're handsome? OK, sure. I hope you're talking about me. But who else? Any other descriptions? If you're, when you think about Hong Kong youth, what do you think? Very smart. Very smart, good. I didn't know where that came from. OK, good. Anybody else? Gaming addicts, OK. Well, I'm going to give you a little, little help. This drawing was actually produced by one of our youth program participants. She was only six, she's only 16 years old. What do you think she's trying to say here? This is her interpretation of Hong Kong youth. She wants love. She wants love. Good. What else? She's shy. She's shy? Yeah. What else? Huh? They wear glasses? OK. Actually, when I asked her, what she told me was that this is a picture of a Hong Kong youth that's coupled, obviously, and they're work, wearing their school uniform. And the young girl actually is quite shy, and so is the boy, but she seems to be less shy than he is. And she's, what she's looking for in Hong Kong youth is that, in terms of partner, she's looking for a guy that gives her security. So that's how she sees Hong Kong youth. How about this one? This was developed by one of our other 16-year-old uh, young person. What do you think she's trying to say? Fashionable. Fashionable. What else? Looking for personality. Looking for personality. Interesting. Someone was saying something out there? Like sorry? <laughs> like what are punters? Patterns. Oh, patterns. I'm sorry. Actually, you guys are all very close. What this young person was saying that for Hong Kong youth, for a young girl, they're very, very fashionable. And they're very trendy. And they're actually very coordinated. But what she did tell me was that when she did this, she also wanted to show us that young girls in Hong Kong actually want to be treated as women. They want to be seen as mature. And that I asked her, why wasn't there a face? And she said that sometimes we just don't have an opinion. We just wait and see. The last picture is a very beautiful picture. What do you think that's trying to say? Freedom, excellent. Anybody else? Huh? Peace? Even. Sorry? Even. Even? Even? Heaven. That's what I thought, too. <laughs> actually, when I asked this person, this person is actually now 19, uh, 21 years old. And what he told me was that this is actually a superhero. And this superhero actually maximized all his potential to reach for the sky. and that. Unfortunately, although this is a very positive picture, this is not what's happening in Hong Kong. And he, what he told me was that young people should be aspiring to this. So those are just some perceptions of young people. Let's talk a little bit more about them. How many young people do you think we have in Hong Kong between 15 to 24 years of age? Well, guess. 1.5 million. Anybody else? More or less? 2 million? More? OK. Actually, there's over 860,000 and two uh, young people that are between 15 to 19 years of age, 24 years of age in Hong Kong. That's about 12.6% of the population. What's really interesting about this is that this is based on the 2011 census. But if you compare it to 2001, the actual population of young people was actually at 920,000, which is a huge big difference. And you can just tell that in Hong Kong, the young population is actually declining. And you probably heard in the media, because of this decline, we're also very worried about the ever aging, growing, aging population in the city. And that there's worriedly concerns that we may not have enough young people to really support the social and economic infrastructure of the, of the entire city. Within this 860,000 young people, there's also very, very diverse young people. What are some of the diversities of Hong Kong? 
Anybody? Yes, we have local Chinese. Within the local Chinese education system, there's over 970,000 secondary and primary students. Ethnic minorities, have you heard of them? Who are the ethnic minorities? Japanese? Hakka? No. The ethnic minorities are the low income, uh, youth from low income backgrounds. They're the Sri Lankans, the Pakistanis, the Nepalese, the Indonesians, right? And that's about 26,000, right? And then we also have the non-Chinese speakers. Who are those? You, yes. So within the community, we also have non-Chinese speakers, which is over 64,000 in the international school system. And they're an extremely, extremely diverse group. We know that based on the census, that there's over 500,000 of these young people who are economically inactive. So what does that really mean, inactive? Anybody? It means they're not working, <laughs> they're not eligible work, or they're just staying at home. We also know that 0.9% of them live alone, right? And that 94.6% of them live with their parents. That's actually quite high. Why do you think 94.6% of them live at home? Hmm? Exactly, it's expensive to move out, right? And with the growing uh, housing prices, which is exorbitant, a lot of these young people can't afford that. Oh, I'm technically challenged, sorry. So this is a map of Hong Kong. Where do you think the highest concentrations of youth are? The top three. Kowloon. Kowloon. Where in Kowloon? <laughs> Close. <laughs> it starts with a K. Guntong, right? At over 75,000. Second? Cham Shui Po? No, not exactly. Highest seniors rate? Not exactly, but, but it has the highest concentration per, I don't know, every day. Sha Tin, actually knows at the north. Okay, and what's the top concentration? Actually, no, it's Sha Tin. And so, why do you think Sha Tin has the highest concentration of youth? You can say that, but Sha Tin has actually been growing uh, extremely fast in the last five to ten years. A lot of the local families prefer to be there because of many things, the education, the transportation system, and also some of the affordability of the housing there. Now, in terms of Hong Kong youth, a lot of times when we think about them, when we see the MTR ads, when we see the poster, we always think that they're very, very happy, don't we? That's the impression we get in the media, that everything is fine. But we all know that in the last five to 10 years, it's actually been very, very difficult for young people. Uh, we're seeing that the growing income gap, we're seeing that a lot of young people are going through various different poverty issues, et cetera, et cetera. And despite the fact that they're going through a lot of difficulties, the government has ways to go and the community in terms of addressing these difficulties. And I wanted to highlight some of it. Poverty. As you heard in the last two months, the Commission on Poverty released its report. And based on that report, they found that over 281,000 young people were poor in the city. And that out of that, over 113,000 of them were at CSSA. Do you know what CSSA is? Comprehensive Social Assistance. Exactly. So that means that young people are extremely poor. And although we don't hear about that in the media, we know that in the community, whether we talk to young people or whether we get to know them, we see signs of poverty. Within our, within our programming, we actually find young people who are in the band three schools. And when we start talking to them, they don't exactly tell us, oh, we're poor. But through conversations with them, we can see that a lot of times they compare themselves to other students. They look at what they don't have, and they, a lot of times they also are worried about their parents who are struggling. Unemployment. Unemployment remains a very big issue in Hong Kong. Who do you think is the most unemployed in the city amongst young people? In Hong Kong. Age group. What's the largest unemployed age group in Hong Kong? Hmm? I sorry, can you hear? It's actually between those who are 15 to 19 years of age. And that, it, that unemployment rate is actually averaging about 12%. And that is actually about three to four times bigger than the adult average in the city. Suicide. Although the suicide rate actually in the city has been decreasing over the last 10 years, we know that it's actually been increasing amongst a certain age group those who are between the ages of 15 to 24. In our programming through the Hong Kong Council, through the Hong Kong University, 
we work with the Center for Suicide Prevention and, and, and Research. And according to Dr. Paul Ip, who is a renowned specialist in suicide, he found that young people between 15 to 24 was actually increasing in the number of rates of, of committed suicide at 24%. We also know that based on the Befrienders uh, Samaritans, that more than 40% increase have taken place this year between January and September. So why is suicide just a big issue? Why do you think it's such a big issue in the city? Anybody? Well, a lot of times it's related to a lot of other issues, such as anxiety, such as stress, such as emotional behavior problems, such as poverty, et cetera. And even in our own programming with our young people, a lot of times they actually come to us asking for help, asking for us to give them some skills, some technology, some, some tools to address the issue within their, their friends. As you know, Hong Kong is also a very stressful and anxious society. It's one of the actually top stressful society in the world. And in a recent survey by the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, they found that 32.7% of young people have admitted to self Harm. What does that mean, self-harm? They're hurting themselves. How are they hurting themselves? Sorry? Exactly. Either through pulling their hair, either through making cuts on their arms, either through purposely bruising themselves, but they're actually hurting themselves to deal with the stress anxiety that they're going through, which is extremely, extremely concerning. In that same study, they also found that 13.7% of respondents had contemplated suicide, and that 4.7% has actually attempted suicide in the city. Depression. Depression is something that we don't really talk about in Hong Kong. We just assume that it's there. But as you know, a lot of studies right now show that depression is actually growing in the city. And young people are not immune to this. In a sampling of 1,033 students by the St. James Settlement Services, they found that between young people, between 11 to 18 years of age, 32.7% of them had depressive tendencies. 14.5% of boys had depressive tendencies, and only 7% of girls. Why was boys, why are boys having been more depressed than girls? Any ideas? Well, based on the same studies, there's a speculation that within the Chinese community or Chinese society, there's a traditional thinking that boys have to be very strong that even if they're going through emotional difficulties or problems at home, they have to contain it. So as a result of the measurements, they found that boys are actually in more in trouble than girls. So why am I talking about all these issues? Because I'm a drug organization. We do drugs. Why do you think we talk about this? It's very much real. What else? It leads to drugs, exactly. A lot of times when I go do talks like this, people will always talk to me about drugs in the, in the sense that we as an organization should really address drugs and just get young people to stop drugs. Well, it's not that easy, right? Looking at drugs, you can't really look at it in terms of the surface level. A lot of times they're what we call these root causes, right? Whether it's poverty, discrimination, suicide, anxiety, boredom, or peer pressure. A lot of times our young people are doing drugs because of these reasons. Now, in terms of the profile of young drug abusers in Hong Kong, do you know what the rate is right now for those who are under 25 years of age? Has anybody read in the news or heard in the media? Right now, according to 2013 uh, first, first half statistics, the drug rate right now is about 24%. And what do you think is the top drug that's being taken in the city? How do you know? <laughs> it's in the newspaper. Ketamine is actually at 56.7%, which is actually quite high. Does anybody know what ketamine is? Go ahead. You want to describe it? It is a drug for the horse. It's a horse tranquilizer, essentially, right? And it is a, it is a legal substance. Yeah. But however, in Hong Kong, it's being taken illegally, right? And it is a hallucinogen, which gives false signals to the brain, right? And it actually comes in tablet form. It could be injected, and it also comes in powder form. And what is so commonly uh, uh, characteristic about uh, canadine is that it's actually very, very cheap. It's one of the cheapest drugs in the world right now. In Hong Kong, we unfortunately have the legacy of having the highest rate of young ketamine users in the world. And it's, a lot of times it's manufactured in China, and not even in China, but in places like in Mangkok and Shamshapo. What's the second highest drug 
that's being taken in Hong Kong? Close. Cocaine at 27.3%, right? And cocaine is actually, I, I'm sure you all know what cocaine is, right? It's actually eight times more expensive than something like ketamine. And it comes in a powder form. And it's actually highly addictive. It's a stimulant that stimulates everything. It makes you grow really, really fast. But what's really addictive about it is that the first high, once you've done it, you really want to do it quickly again, right? What's the third one? Someone said ice, right? And it's actually ice. Right? And ice is actually a stimulant again, and it's something that you smoke through a pipe, and it causes everything to be very fast again. Right? Now, in terms of the profile of drug users in Hong Kong, we know that do drugs only happen to young people from poor backgrounds? What's the, what's the ratio? Does anybody know? Actually, it's pretty even. In Hong Kong, drug abusers who are young are actually about 33 per 33% for those who are in public housing states, another 33.9% for those who live in private housing. In terms of the trends, something that's really phenomenal, that's happening right now in Hong Kong is called hidden drug abuse. Have you heard of that term before? In the last five years, the government, the community, has been very concerned about this is because of this phenomenon called hidden youth. And whether it's exclusively only in Hong Kong or happening around the world, Hidden youth essentially means that young people are actually hiding themselves in the room. And what do they think they're doing in their rooms besides drugs? They're actually on social media. They're on the internet. They're playing with their phones, right? And they're, sorry? Studying. They're studying, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and they're actually doing all sorts of things that we, know, we don't know, right? And a lot of times when we're talking with our, our, our parents and teachers and social workers, they're asking us how to get them out of the rooms because this seems to be such a common thing. And in Hong Kong, despite the fact that the drug rate has actually been declining the last five years, the hidden drug rate has actually been increasing, right? So from 14.6% to about 20.7% between 2008, 2009, and 2011, 2012. At this moment, the government actually does not have a real strategy in how to really address this issue. One of the things they're thinking about is doing mandatory drug testing, which the community actually has some concerns about because it'll actually further marginalize these youth and make them hide even more. But we don't know, right? The other thing is the first statistic I told you is that once they're taking drugs, they're also hiding, but they're also doing it alone. They're not seeking for any help, which is very concerning for us because if they're not seeking for any help, they're also not getting off the habit. In terms of places of where they're taking drugs, we know that some of them are taking it at their friends, schoolmates, and neighbors at 33%, while others are taking it at their homes. And usually when their parents are not there, um, they're taking drugs. And in terms of where they're accessing it, a lot of times they're getting it free. It's either someone who bought the drug or someone just got it somewhere else and just gave it to them. And what's really interesting is that a lot of times when we talk to young people about drugs, they would say, it's not a big deal. I'll just try it. It's free. And a lot of times they also say that, if I try it once, I won't necessarily get addicted. We also know that 34.4%, 34.0% also use their own money to buy drugs. Even if they're poor, they will find ways to find that. Find means, find ways to find money to buy drugs. And then that also 19.0% through compensating dating. Do you know what that is? What's compensating dating? <laughs> Can anybody tell me? Exactly. So compensating dating is an is a issue that was very much um, publicized in the media a couple of years ago. And what it involves is that local Chinese girls are meeting men over the internet or on site. And they actually go on dates with them and exchange for money. And in this case, they're exchanging for money to buy drugs. And actually, in some of our schools that we've done these assessments with and observations, some of the girls did tell us that they'd do that. And of course, we can't disclose that that's happened, right? But does that, it, it does happen. Oh, sorry, that's my last slide. Oh, I'm, I'm very technically challenged. So why, so I gave you all this information is, there's many reasons why, why a lot of young people are taking drugs. Do you, a lot of times people in, in the community, service providers, parents, and, and concerned citizens are always wondering why do they take drugs? And what are the reasons behind that? Does anybody know what's the top one? why young people are taking drugs in the city? Peer influence, right? 
Um, if you looked at the study from the government and also the studies that are out there, young people have actually said, local Chinese youth have said that the people that influence them the most are their peers. If they have any problems, they actually go to their peers. They don't go to the parents or the social workers. What do you think is the second reason that young people take drugs in the city? They're bored, exactly. That's exactly why they're taking drugs. In the, at, that's about 46.4%. And people would ask our organization, well, there's so much things to do for young people. Why are they still bored? Why do they need to take drugs? And we don't actually have a definitive answer. But when we talk to our youth, a lot of times they'll say that they've done it all and that drugs is a way for them to escape. And for others, as I mentioned before, trying it once is not a big deal. What do you think is the third reason why young people take drugs? Avoid discomfort. What does that mean? To avoid discomfort. Social pressures, exactly. At 22.7%, a lot of people avoid uh, discomfort as either it's physical, mental, or psychological. They see that taking drugs is a way to go and a way to escape from that reality. So in terms of Kelly Support Group, um, I'd like to share a few a couple of cases in terms of the young people that we deal with. A lot of times when young people come to see us, it's not because so much that they're not aware of their drug habit or their drug problem. A lot of times they're actually in trouble or their parents get uh, found out about it or they actually get expelled. Um, I'll give you a case scenario where a young person actually came to me because their parents forced him to and actually the parents came with him. But in that initial assessment session, he actually didn't say anything, right? Because the parents were there. And when he did ask his parents to leave, and so that he can talk to me, he actually disclosed to me that he's been taking drugs for a very long time and that he was going through a lot of pressure and that this was something that's very common in the whole school. He also said that he was very guilty about what he was doing and that despite the fact that his parents gave him everything, he felt that he failed them. Which was very unfortunate was that through the whole story, what he couldn't see was that there's actually a lot of positive characteristics about him and that actually he has a lot going for him. And in that process, we also learned that you know, it wasn't so much that he didn't want to get off the drug habit, but that he didn't see that there was any way out of it, right? Another story is that a lot of times when we deal with young people through our prevention efforts, we never know who will come to us. Whether it's our drug education or alcohol addictions education, we would have, for example, one or two young persons that would come to us and say, I actually been dealing with drugs, or I have someone that's pressuring me to do drugs. And they all, a lot of times, thank us for talking about it and giving them this, the skills and the techniques to actually refuse it. So where does this lead us? Well, at Kelly, we don't really have a definitive answer in terms of how to address issues. We have a series of strategies. And one of the things that I would really like to leave off with is that when you look at young people today, don't look at the surface. Engage them. Try to really understand that what they're going through is not really what you may see. Right? Talk to them. Ask them how things are going in their school, in their life. Ask them how they see the world. Ask them about what you're doing, what they're doing. The second thing I would say is that be supportive of our young people. When we talk to our young people in, in Hong Kong, we're seeing that they're really craving for your support. Whether you do reflective listening, whether you, just lit, whether you give them a shoulder to cry on, use positive reinforcement words, it really means a lot to them. The third thing is also be empathetic. We really stress that when we're working with young people, don't feel sorry for them. They don't need you to feel sorry for them. Put yourself in their shoes, see the world through their eyes, and try to help them come up with strategies. The fourth thing that I'd like to say is be confidential. When we work with our young people, we make sure that what they say to us, we don't share with the rest of the world. We don't give the names, we don't give the, the details, or et cetera, because you never want young people to feel that they can't trust you. The last thing we really want to stress is that when you're working with young people in Hong Kong, it's actually, they're actually quite diverse. Whether it's an ethnic minority, a non-Chinese speaker, a person with disability, or someone with mental health issues, we need to make sure that we make them included and feel included in the process that we're trying to help them in. So in conclusion, I want to stress one thing, is that you may want to know what you can do in terms of young people who are having these issues. One thing you do is also be looking at what is ways to help them become better citizens, listen to them, and just try to be there for them. Thank you.